This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where we take a closer look and dig a little deeper into this week's sermon. What's up, man? I'm good. How are you? I'm all right. Uh, just got out of two back-to-back classes. Um, on the day that we're recording this, it's the day before Election Day, so I yeah, did man. all my research on candidates today. And yeah, I voted last week. Yeah, you did. Yeah, it. Uh, yeah, because of that, I mean, it's it's an emotional, week time process for everyone. Um, I think it's um, it's just really overwhelming for a lot of people. Um, because yeah. the media, you know, we just talk about it and talk about it and talk about it, and there's two or three or four sides to every story and multiple narratives and people get overwhelmed with content and just get to the point where they just go hands off. Like, I don't want to vote. Like I don't like I'm too overwhelmed. I know so many people that that have that, have that view. And then there's also those that get, excuse me, so overwhelmed that they just walk in there and punch a straight ticket and don't even know what they're voting for. Yeah. They don't do all their research on all the candidates and, it's hard. It is hard. It really voting in a republic like we have, and I say that because I don't believe that we truly are a democracy. We are a republic. If we were a true democracy, we would vote on everything. Yeah. And a great example is when President Trump was like, they were trying to impeach him. Mm-hmm. Like a true democracy, the people would have voted on whether or not that should have happened. Yeah. So that's why I say we're a republic, not a democracy, because we don't vote on everything. But in a republic like we are, um, voting is a blessing and a curse. Yes, it is. Because it is a blessing that you get a voice. It is a curse because it's a lot of work to use that voice in an informed way. No, and you're right. It is. It's overwhelming for a lot of people because, I mean, what? how do you know what news outlet to trust? I mean, you can have two news outlets report the exact same headline and two radically different interpretations and meanings of what that headline is. Oh, absolutely. Um, 100%. But then it's even more complicated, like we were talking about on Let's Talk uh, not too long ago, right? Yeah, because, in politics series. Yeah, there's, there's um, a, another level of responsibility for you as a Christian yeah. participating in politics. Yeah. Um, so it becomes way more complicated. Yeah. Once you add, once you throw in that variable, yeah, it's just hard. That's why um, I strategically preached the sermon that I did this past week because, um, like Jesus was in the business of restoration for all people. Yeah, and so uh, no matter what, who you vote for, how you vote, how you view the world, like there's restoration for you, and that that statement alone should be peaceful. It should be calming. It should relieve anxieties uh, and excite joy. Amen. So talk to us about your sermon for, for this episode. Yeah. So we, so if you don't know, we record these episodes quite a bit uh, in advance. Like Clayton said, you know, we're recording this the week, the day before election day, but this won't come out until two Three weeks from now. Two or three weeks after that. So we record these in advance. Um, And right now we're in a series that I'm calling Because of Faith. Um, I'm just fascinated with this idea about what faith is. And I gave a definition last week on this podcast that faith is is the ex- is your expectancy that God's power is going to meet your vulnerability. Mm. Like that is what faith is. That's yeah. the formula of faith. And last week we looked at this text where there's this woman who's been hemorrhaging blood. She's got open wounds or bleeding in some kind of profusely way. And... 
she just touches Jesus' cloak and she's healed. Jesus didn't actively heal her. He just finds out after the power leaves him. And so it's like her faith single-handedly was enough to actively find restoration. Yeah. And there's another story coupled with this that I'm going to save for probably next week. Because uh, this is only going to be a four-part series because I really want to get into our Advent uh, series. And we're going to be we're gonna be one week late on Advent. Advent is uh, starts at the end of November. Yeah. Um, and we're not going to. We're going to start it uh, first week of December. And, that, and that's completely okay. Um, you know, that the, the reason we're participating in Advent be, is because we think that it's an important time to recognize yeah. Um, but, um, you don't have to stick to the rigidity so close, right? Yeah. I, I don't feel that that's completely well, I think, necessary. I think for me it was twofold. Number one, I think, um, this year in 2020, with the crazy year that we've had. Yeah. I think it's really important for us to take the holidays in definite stages. Oh, hundred percent. Where we can enjoy a time of Thanksgiving and like, let that be its own thing. Like, I think a lot of years Thanksgiving is the speed bump that you got to go through to in the school zone. So you can get on the highway headed to Christmas. Yeah. Um, and I don't think this year we should treat it that way. No, I agree. Um, I think that this year is, probably the most important year we've had in a long time that it's important to remember why we're thankful for something. Yeah. Um, I think there's been, and that's the thing. There's been a lot of loss this year. Yeah. People have lost jobs. People have lost friends, family, people have lost a way of life. Yeah. Um, and when there's that much loss, it's just really important to remember Thanksgiving and hope. Yeah. And so I wanted, I didn't want to bump right after Thanksgiving, right into Advent, because it immediately puts everybody's eyes on Christmas. I didn't want to take away from that time to focus and meditate and contemplate on Thanksgiving. Um, And so I shortened Advent from five weeks to four. And um, the other thing I think is it's, a new month is a really easy transition. Yeah. And so just thinking through how to do that, that's what I decided to do. But anyway, so we're doing this about faith leading up to our Advent series. And right after this story of the woman hemorrhaging blood with this other story that I'm going to probably preach on next week, they're coming right out of that story is another really fascinating story. And so I'm fascinated with this idea of the role of faith Mm -hmm. and just like how that plays out in our life. Because we call Christianity a faith. Yeah. Right? It's like it's a form of having faith. Mm -hmm. But what does it truly mean to have faith? And so... I started looking in the Gospels and I saw all this language that Jesus uses and it's because of faith, this happens to you. And I just really became in awe of that because I I always viewed, so me personally in my own faith, Not too long ago, I began to wrestle with and question this idea of an all-supreme, all-powerful God. Because if we truly believe that God is all-powerful and wholly good, both W-H-O-L-L-Y and H-O-L-Y, wholly good and all-powerful, how could that God allow for the Holocaust? How could that God allow for genocide? How could that God allow for not even micro evil, but just macro evil? 
Yeah. How could he uh, allow for the, the oppression that we're seeing today? Yeah. And so I really began to question this idea of what, what that really looks like. Um, and for me, there's a really, really long way to that. I think I've come to reconcile those that we probably need to talk about on pints and perspectives at another time. But one of them is faith. Mm. Um, because we see massive things happen because of faith. Yeah. And so the first half of this series, which we're going to end today is about the faith of an individual for themselves. The second half of the series is what happens because of the faith that someone has for someone else. Yeah. Like there are stories in the text where someone has enough faith for another person to experience healing and restoration. Um, is uh, the the story where the that guy's friends lower? Yeah, him you down. joker, <laughs> giving away my sermon series. Yeah, that's one of them. Okay. Yeah, uh, there I was, are. I was wondering if that was going to come up. Yeah, there are multiple stories. Uh, yeah. where that happens, but yeah, that's one of the ones I'm going to bring. Okay, awesome. Jerk. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so the story that I preached yesterday. Um, it says, this is in Matthew nine, picking up at verse 28. It says, uh, I'm sorry. In 27, Jesus left the official's house. And as he was walking, two blind men began to follow him. The blind men shouted, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus went to their house and the blind men sat in front of him. Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? They replied emphatically, yes, Lord. Jesus, touching their eyes, says, according to your faith, it will be done to you. And they could see. Wow. That word emphatically. Um, yeah, so I'm adding that to the text just because okay. of my own translation. Just the word order and the way that... Um, I'm translating that, but it is, it is an emphatic, like the word order there is leading you to believe that this is like, this is unshakable. Yes. We absolutely believe that you can accomplish this. Mm. So there's a deep level of faith there. Oh yeah. And, and this is another thing I didn't, I don't talk about it in the sermon because you know, when, when you're only preaching 12 or 15 minutes, you can't really get into these details. And that's why we have this podcast, but Jesus asked them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yeah. But then he says, according to your faith, it will be done. So, you know, do this is a great question. Do you think of belief and faith as synonymous or different? Yeah. So this is this might be kind of challenging that um, a bit because I would say no, um, that, that they're different. Um, I don't know. So how would you define the difference? So for me, faith is one of those things that I've had a, um, a hard time kind of trying to define uh, and t until we started the series, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I always kind of thought about belief is um, just some, basically some head knowledge, right? Whereas faith is internalized. Or you, you're not totally sure um, how that belief fits into practice. Does that make sense? And, and you just know that God's going to work it out for the best. Um, okay, so... Um, did that make sense? I don't know. No, so you're saying belief is a head knowledge and faith is how you put it in practice. So you're trying to do like the knowledge and wisdom breakdown? Uh, maybe sort of, kind of. Okay. I don't know. Um, I, I honestly hadn't put much thought into it, to it until just now. Well, uh, you know, I hadn't put much thought into it either <laughs> uh, until I had to. Um, it's, it's really hard. They, 
um, they are, um, they're similar words. Faith and belief. Yeah, in Greek, they're they're basically the same word. It's almost like belief is the verb and like I believe right. active and faith is the noun or adjective, like mm-hmm. having faith. It's more passive. Um, and so, so I say faith is your expectancy. Right. But in that, in that in expectancy, you can be passive. Like you can be in a posture of passivity while having expectancy. Mm. Right. So, um, I guess a relevant example would be tomorrow. I'm going to be sitting in a chair in a very passive way because I know that the results of the election are out of my hands, but I'm going to expect that there's going to be an announcement of the president. Right. Right. So you can have faith and expectancy in something in a passive way, but if you truly believe in something, that's an active thing. Yeah. Um, and so here he asked them, do you believe that I can do this? emphatically yes they've demonstrated that they believe because they've walked they've followed him they've done an action Mm -hmm. think back to the woman hemorrhaging blood she crawls through the crowd to works to try to touch the end of jesus's cloak yeah she goes about a motion she she progresses down a path she shows initiative Mm. and it's in her initiative that the faith becomes evident that it's just deeply, deeply embedded in her Mm. that I just know in my soul, faith is ingrained that I, and, and so faith is the thing I have inside of me and belief is what I do in light of that faith. Yeah. Um, and so Jesus, and I think this is so interesting because Jesus then says, According to your faith, it will be done to you. We talked about this on Let's Talk, I think. I asked you a question, like, how many blind people are there in the U.S.? Like, oh, legally yeah, blind. That was, that was Not like, legally blind, but they see, like, just straight black. Yeah, I think that was... No, that was on this podcast, I think, when we talked about... Um, um, it would have been the episode that went out today. Um, I'm pretty sure. I don't think so. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it was Let's Talk. Yeah. Either way, I think there's something really interesting about that idea of being blind. Because, you know, we now know that there are levels of blindness. Yeah. Right? But um, I don't know that the ancient world would have conceived that. Yeah. It's... You know, it's like, hey, can you read this? No. Can you see how many fingers I'm holding up? No. Oh, you're blind. Right. Like, if you can't see this, you can't see to harvest the wheat in the field or not good for anything. So you're just blind. Right. Like, we just kind of W that and go on about our way. And so we don't know the level of these men's blindness. But when Jesus says, according to... When I say that, according to, like, how would you use that in modern day language? According to, I don't know, according to CNN or or whatever, like you're trying to refer back to something um, to kind of bolster something else. Okay, so... According to, in Greek, it's it's a word of perception. Mm. Or maybe not perception, but perspective. So, in Greek, the titles of all the Gospels 
Whereas we have them as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm-hmm. In Greek, they're according to Matthew, right. according to Mark. They're a way of perspective for one person. And so when Jesus says according to, there's something very unique that's happening there. He could have just said, your faith has made you well. Right. right. We see him use that language in other places. Yeah. But he doesn't. He says, according to your faith, or maybe another way to translate it is on account of your faith. Mm. And for me, when I read that, leads me to remember that faith is measurable. Yeah. So there are a few places that I argue for the measurability of faith. Number one is in John 2 at the wedding at Cana Mm -hmm. when Jesus tells the servants to go fill the water jars. The text is very explicit in noting that they filled them to the brim. Right. Because faith is measurable. Mm. Um, Also, Jesus himself says that faith is measurable when he says, I tell you, if if you remember in the Gospels, the the disciples try to heal this man. They try to do an exorcism on this man that has a demon. Right. And they can't exorcise the demon, so they come to Jesus. And Jesus actually says this really weird thing to them, like, you wicked generation. Yeah. Or like worthless generation, like really weird thing. And then exercise the demons. And he says, I tell you, if you could even have the faith of a mustard seed, you could say to that mountain, move, and it would obey. Right. Well, putting it in a term of if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you've made faith measurable. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So faith is definitely measurable. Um, And so here, when it says, according to your faith, it will be done, it's unique. That language is unique to the blind person. Like, he doesn't use that for anybody else. Right. And so I almost wonder if, this is 100% speculative, and I acknowledge that, but the language of according to makes me believe that these men are fully blind, like only see black, and the measurability of their faith determines the restoration that they receive. Mm. So that they may have been partially healed, fully healed, whatever. It seems in the way, because this story is recorded in multiple Gospels. I've chosen the Matthew one. But the Mark one, it says that they're healed immediately and that Jesus tells them to be quiet and not tell anyone and they run away and tell everyone. Right. So it seems to be that they're fully healed. But the change in language here about the according to your faith leads me to believe that not only is faith uh, a stagnant thing that I have or I don't have, but it's a thing that's measurable Right. And so if I have a little faith, I'll see a little miracle. Right. But if I have big faith, if I have great faith, I'll see a great miracle. I'll see full on restoration. Yeah. Um, is this, uh, what would it be now um, a time to, to briefly talk about, um, you know, the, the spiritual gift of miraculous healing. Um, like if, yeah. if you have the faith that as you pray over this person, that they're going to be healed. If you genuinely internalize that faith, will that person be healed? Um, yeah. Um, that's really, really hard. Yeah. Um, because... You know, 1 Corinthians 14 is where we get, like, that miraculous healing listed in a list of spiritual gifts. And at the beginning of that passage, Paul urges them... To pray for the higher gifts. Yeah, to seek them, pursue them, 
uh, some translations say earnestly desire. It's not an easy word to translate, but like this is a sought after thing. Right. You've got to go above and beyond for this. Like this, and I think the way that Paul does this is there are gifts, like in First Corinthians twelve, that are given to you right. when you become a Christian, and then there are other gifts that you've got to seek. Yeah. You've got to ask for. You've got to work for. And those are the ones that show up in 14. Right. And that's why 13 is so impactful that it's right there in the middle of the love chapter. Right. Because you only get these when you truly understand love. Right. And so it's hard because one of the places that we see miraculous healing so much outside of Jesus is in Acts. Okay. And so like we have Acts chapter 3 and Peter is walking up to the temple with John and there's a beggar there. And he says, can you spare some money? Peter's like, bro, I'm broke, but uh, I can heal you. Yeah. And he just reaches down and grabs this beggar, like yeah. this lame man, grabs him and yanks him up. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh my gosh. Like You think about that. How much faith does it take? And, and the text is very clear that this is right outside the temple. Mm -hmm. So there yeah. are a bunch of people watching. Mm -hmm. And Peter just yanks this homeboy up. What faith does that take? Because can you imagine the embarrassment, the shame that's lumped on Peter if that man's not healed? Oh, yeah. Like, what faith yeah. does that take? Oh, my gosh. It, two mustard seeds. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, that man might as well be a, a very, very large mountain. Yeah. Um, but then you also have this weird passage in Acts chapter 19 mm -hmm. where people are being healed but this is in the first part of Acts 19, if anybody's looking. Um, people are healed by Paul's prayer cloth. Yeah. Not that he's actively praying with them, but that he has a cloth that he holds when he prays. It's like a spiritual token of sorts. Mm -hmm. People are picking it up and being healed. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know, man. It's like faith is something that's so embedded in you that it becomes it kind of radiates. Yeah. You just embody it. Yeah. And in your embodying of faith, you act in belief. Yeah. Mm, that's challenging. Yeah. It's, I don't think it's easy. Yeah. Um, Cause Ben, Ben Blackwell and I recorded a, seven or eight episodes of pints and perspectives on the kingdom of God that are last coming out week. Soon. Yeah. They, they start uh, this week. Yeah. Go check them out. They're great. Um, and in there, we talk about this idea of the, the disenchanted world yeah. where we no longer view things as spiritual. Whereas now we have modern medicine and we've limited the role of spirituality in all manner of life. The ancient world wouldn't have done that. Yeah. I mean, when they looked at someone that we would now call mental illness, they called it demon possession, right? So they had a hyper-spiritualized world where we have a de-spiritualized world. And so for them, faith was embodied. Yeah. Like they, like spirituality was just very central to who they were, the spiritual realm, like that, that permeated their worldview. Yeah. So for us to live in this disenchanted world of modernity and postmodernity, to get to a point and live a way where faith embodies who you are, yeah, is very, very challenging and difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so take this as a charge to all of our listeners. Um, do your best to go out there and embody faith. Um, live it out, day in, day out. And as you do, you might see some miraculous things start changing around you.